Welcome to the Speak Like a Leader podcast with John Bates. Welcome to the show. With me today, I have someone that I admired before I even knew I admired her. And she's somebody who is just the go-to person for what she does in much of the universe that I exist in. And her name is AJ Harper. And she's an editor and publishing strategist who helps authors write transformational books that enable them to build leadership or excuse me, build readership, grow their brand, and make a significant impact on the world. She works as a ghostwriter and as a developmental editor. She's worked with hundreds of authors, from newbies to New York Times bestselling authors, with millions of books sold. And she can't tell us everyone that she's worked with. In fact, she probably can't tell us about most of the people she's worked with. But uh, we found each other through Mike Michalowicz and Mike Michalowicz is loud and proud about the people that support him. And I think it's one of his greatest traits. And I also am really thrilled that I got to meet AJ Harper because of Mike. So AJ, thank you very much for joining us. I'm really excited to have you on speak like a leader dot show and, and, and thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So, so AJ, I, I want to talk about the world of publishing and the world of book writing and all that stuff that you know so intimately well, and that I think you could share some really important knowledge with our listeners around. And before we go into that, though, I want to ask a little bit about like AJ Harper, the person behind all of these successes. And I want to ask you about, you know, who was somebody throughout your life, somewhere in your life, that was a great leader that really had an impact on you? And, and you know, what comes to mind when I ask you about that? And, and tell us the story about, about that person, would you? And you don't have to name names if, if you don't want to. Just who, who had an impact on A.J. Harper? Well, certainly lots of people had an impact on me. The fir- my first teacher to recognize that I had some writing ability and encouraged me with that. And her name was Antropa Collins and she was from Latvia and she was, wow. She had, she kept tubes of caviar in her desk. (laughs) (laughs) Cause that's, that's what you do in Latvia. Vibrant scarves. And she never ever let us meet her husband. It was very mysterious, but I think the person who shaped me the most, who's not in my family would be the late great, Senator Paul Wellstone from Minnesota. Many people don't remember him, but he died in a plane crash right before the the election. And but I had looked up to him for a really long time and worked with a lot of people who were on his campaign because I was happened to be working on poverty issues at the time when I still had a regular job aside from just writing. And he was to me the epitome of a great great leader and one of the things he said that he's famous for saying that I live by is we all do better when we all do better. Oh, that's great. And I live by that for sure. And I live by that in my life and how I view the world, but and how I help people, but also in my work. Okay. And I think that that's, uh, that makes sense when I hear it in retrospect, given what I know about you and, you know, all the things that you do with, with Mike Michalowicz and with other people. We all do better when we all do better. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's great. That's great. And so, and so you were working uh, on poverty issues. Do you mind telling me a little bit about that? Sure. I didn't have the glamorous job. So I worked for a um, place called Minnesota Community Action Association. Uh-huh. And, um, so they represented 27 community action agencies in the state of Minnesota uh, that were all on poverty issues. And I worked the office management job. So I got to do all the unsexy things like uh, organize board meetings and events and handle the money. But I also got to take stacks and stacks of flyers onto the Capitol floor. And in Minnesota, it's, um, it's freezing a good part of the year. So there's an underground tunnel system that connects offices to the Capitol building. So I spent a good part of my time walking back and forth through these tunnels, trying to find 
uh, senators and representatives uh, so we could sway them on poverty issues. And in the process of my having my very unsexy job, I learned a lot about poverty issues and got to meet some really cool people. Well, and it's funny to me because uh, I didn't realize this about you, AJ, but I did know that Mike Michalowicz's job, you know, his whole mission is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. And as he does that, I think he is having an, a, a massive impact on poverty issues in general because so many people are entrepreneurs, right? Yeah, he really, that is his passion. He's committed to it and he knows he's not going to solve the whole issue, but he's right. really, really trying. And, he, yeah. and part of it is because he's, he is an entrepreneur and he, he feels he's felt that pain and he feels such a kinship with them, but also because he knows it can save the world because entrepreneurs right. innovate, they create new technology, they solve problems and they provide jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, and, 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 you know, by the way, the office management, the unsexy job yeah. that just makes everything happen. Right. I know who the boss really is when I walk in and I say hello to the office <laughs> manager, you know? Uh, so what, so how did you go from that to what you're doing now? What was the, what was the kind of defining moment of that transition? Well, that was my, what we call in the arts, a straight job. So that was my day nine to five, but I was a playwright at the time. And playwrights are just like a rung, like one tiny rung above poets in terms of how much money are you going to make? <laughs> I was a playwright for a long time and I loved it and may go back to it someday. But when I had my son, I decided, okay, I really just want to be home with him and I'm going to not I don't and you know any job I would have had would have taken me away because an executive right. assistant level type work is not 40 hours a week yeah so we decided to move to New York and I decided I would make money doing anything any kind of writing at all as long as it wasn't illegal <laughs> uh -huh. and I did and I was inspired partly to do that because I had finally solved a writer's block problem with the help of reading The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. So I knew... The War of Art? Yeah, that's... Anyone who knows me knows I'm obsessed. I'm, I promise I'm not a stalker of his, but he, he wrote a book called The War of Art, which was transformational for me and helped me finally solve the writer's block issue, which I came to know is actually not a thing. <laughs> uh -huh. That actually allowed me to have a career. And in fact, uh, when Stephen Pressfield agreed to endorse my book... That was probably my biggest cry day ever because he is my literary hero for sure. That is fabulous. The, okay. So that's, that's, I mean, this is awesome. You, you had these jobs, you had, you know, you could have done that some more, but then you had your son and wanted to be home with him. Yeah. So you ended up kind of, maybe it sounds like, starting out doing any kind of writing and you back your way into totally changing the world. <laughs> I just got lucky because about it, you know, within the first year of freelancing, someone hired me to go write a book and that person happened to be very well connected in the world of prescriptive nonfiction, personal and professional development books, any book that's designed to make something better, your business, your body, your marriage, your whatever, right? Yeah. She happened to know so many folks and she was happy with the book. And that just, all of a sudden, that's what I was doing. That is awesome. Well, so that kind of brings us to maybe where we'll spend most of our time in this conversation, which is that world of books and probably mostly nonfiction books. Cause I, you know, I think who's listening is entrepreneurs, organizational leaders, lots of people at large organizations like Johnson and Johnson and Boston scientific, and, you know, even potentially folks at NASA. And I think that a lot of the people that I work with who have a message and a lot of the people at these organizations who are in these leadership positions, I think it's a pretty good idea for them to think about writing a book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and one of the things that I didn't realize for a long time, AJ is the power of doing something once with the intention of it being 
a repeatable experience for others, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I think that would be, you could say that about a book. What I did first was I created my online course, the speak like a leader bootcamp. Mm -hmm. And I just took that thing that I used to have to show up in person to do and got a great team around me, which, you know, that's you, I, that would be akin to you and your team for someone writing a book. They really had me gr create a great, great, great online course. And that course now does all the work for me. I don't have to show up when I'm going to do one-on-one -on -one executive coaching. That's the prerequisite. People do that coach and they do that course. And I don't have to be there and say that over and over and over again, because it does. And I think it's it with a book in some ways, I think it's even more generous because it allows you to just make some of your greatest wisdom and realizations and thoughts and offerings available in a super portable self, you know, regulated manner. I just think it it's, I just didn't get the, the power of it till I did it myself, how valuable it is to, to, and how generous it is to take the time and the effort. Cause it's that, but once you do that, once that book is done and it will live forever potentially, and could make a difference for millions and millions of people. Yeah. You get, so you can change the world. Uh, you have a better chance of changing the world through a book than any other means. Mm -hmm. because it can be read by so many different people. One book by itself, just one copy of it can be passed around and passed around and passed around and passed around. Yeah. Never mind all the copies of it. Yeah. So, uh, and, you, and people can get it for free, which is really important to me and my value system, which is why I wrote my book because I wanted to sort of democratize the knowledge I had. And I think if there are people who are doing high level experiences or there's only people in your organization who are learning for you from you, but you really want more people to have access to it. If that's a value you have, then writing a book is great, especially because then people, even if they don't have 27 bucks to buy it, they can go to the library and check it out. Yeah. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, tell us about your book, AJ, because I, I, I know that you actually, uh, kind of, I think, um, counterintuitively go out of your way to make it free to people. Yeah. Um, so t tell us, you know, tell us about your book, about your book. Thank you. It is after more than a hundred books written and more than 150, I think edited. I did write a book with my own name on it. Yeah. <laughs> now keep in mind when I say a hundred books written, some of them were really, really short. Just so we're, uh -huh. okay. All of them were Mike McCallowitz length books. Yeah, But I have been at it for almost 18 years, so you get a lot uh -huh. more than 18 years. I did. I wrote it for the reason I just stated, because I, I knew that... So let me back up. It, I retired from ghostwriting about 10 years in, so mm -hmm. six years now-ish. Uh -huh. And it was Mike who convinced me that I could teach my process. I had interest, people wanting to learn from me, client work, et cetera, to write their own book. Uh -huh. Insisting, this is instinctive in me. I am the special one. I, only, I know how to do this. I could never teach it. And Mike said, literally, I won't curse on here, but he said, BS. And that's your ego talking. And you have systems. You just don't know what they are. Yeah. So I always take a mic challenge and I decided to do client work to see if I could figure it out. Yeah. So I took work instead of ghostwriting clients, I took author clients who wanted to write their own books and I coached them through the whole process. And, and then I took copious notes. What am I saying all the time? Right. Well, how, how am I teaching this to someone as opposed to doing it for someone? Yeah. Then I transferred. Once I knew what I was doing, I made a course and that is a very, hands-on workshop that I love that's only do for a small amount of people. And then that's when I realized because I was, they were getting such incredible results. And I thought, okay, this really works, not just for me to do it, but for other people to do it. And it's going to solve a major problem. So let me make sure I have a book out there so that people who can't afford my class or, or can't get into my class for some reason can still learn from me. And what's your book called, AJ? It's called Write a Must Read. 
Right, a must read, and people can find that on Amazon anywhere. or anywhere. Yep. Okay, great. Write a must read, and it has AJ Harper's name on it. Yeah, finally. Very good. And what is your what is your online course called? It's called Top Three Book Workshop, and I named it that because it's for folks who want to write a book that ends up one of those top books on someone's nightstand or those top books that someone recommends. What are your three best business books? What are your three best books on productivity? What are your three best books on relationships? Yeah. It's for the folks who want to write that book versus any book. Great. And just so that people know, just in case they're, you know, chomping at the bit to go see, you, what's your website? It's ajharper.com. And then you mentioned free stuff. I give a ton of free stuff over at writeamustread.com. Okay, great. So, uh, so people can find you at ajharper.com, mm-hmm. but if they go to write a must read.com, they will, they'll they get some, get free, some stuff. Good free stuff. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, um, so from your perspective, knowing that the audience is entrepreneurs, leaders of organizations, potentially at large fortune 500 type organizations, what would you say, I guess maybe there's some sub audiences that we should carve out from that. So let's start with, with, um, an entrepreneur, Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is the, what is your thinking for an entrepreneur who's trying to decide they, they think maybe they've got a book in them. They're not sure. Like what, what, what's your overlay for them? Should they, whether they should write one or not? Yeah. Or how could they figure out if they should and, you know, et cetera. I mean, I think if you're an entrepreneur and it's true that any book will move you further along, if you want more clients, if you're going to start speaking and you want gigs or better gigs or, um, whatever lead gen, you're going to do a course, but Uh that's true. But it, you have to want to write a book that people will actually read. Mm-hmm. Not a fan of the better business card mentality. Just get a book out yeah. there. <laughs> uh-huh. It needs to be a book that people actually read, actually finish, and actually do the work so that they experience change. And then they tell everybody about it because then they will tell everybody yeah. about it. And that actually will catapult you to all those things you already wanted to do. That's the irony is people take shortcuts when it's time to write books thinking I'm, I just need to get it out there or it's just for lead gen. Mm-hmm. Actually, the ultimate lead gen is writing a book that people love. Yeah, there you go. So I think the first thing is to just make that commitment is, do you yeah. really want to do that? Cause it's time intensive, but there's so many benefits to writing a great book. Yeah. That actually does that because even yeah. though it might take you a while and there's a lot of effort and there's a mindset that you need to have to kind of handle the roller coaster of writing a book. You will clarify as an entrepreneur your processes, frameworks, messaging, your customer. Yeah. All of that becomes tighter. I have so many students who came through workshop who applied a bunch of stuff to their own business and changed them. So the uh, process of writing a book can also transform you as an entrepreneur because it gives you more clarity and focus. Yeah, I so plus one to that for sure. Uh, you know, and, and it reminds me of a saying that used to drive me crazy. I just kind of hated the guy who would say this to me, but he would say to me, John, my crappy book is way better than your no book. And I think that there's some truth to that, but what you're making me really think about is the, is the follow up to that, which would be, and my excellent book is way better than your no book or your crappy book, right? Like an excellent book is really ultimately, if you're going to spend time and energy on it anyway, why not just do the leap from no book to excellent book? <laughs> just try at least. I don't know. I'm going to be a counterpoint on that. I think that's not true. The uh-huh. crappy book is better than no book. But if you only care that people know that you have one, then that would be true. Yeah. And I think that was kind of the point of that, but I just think the point you're making is far better. Yeah. I have a, I have the, I think I tell this story actually, but I, I 
am still gobsmacked by this person who hired me to write her second book and wouldn't let me read her first one because she was so embarrassed. Oh, wow. <laughs> you don't want to be that person. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, um, so that's the entrepreneur. How about for the person who's in a, um, I mean, I have a, I have a certain feeling about this. The person who's in a high level job at a big organization, you know, Accenture, Johnson and Johnson, whatever. I personally feel like what a great time to write a book, right? Because you've got all these, all this attention, you've got this great position, you know, people are going to listen to what you say more than if you didn't have that position, you're going to get a lot more traction than if you didn't. And the organization, if you write a bestseller, how happy are they? Right. Right. And if you're trying to move up in the organization or move sideways or diagonally in the organization, or you want to move somewhere else, or maybe you're carving out your next stage, or in addition to that, you want to do keynoting or whatever, yeah. You know, you you want to definitely get the book done, but I think for entrepreneurs and then also people in corporate, the question is is there something that you have to say that you know if we just understood this one thing, we would the world would be better. Your industry would be better, your community would be better, the work environment would be better, whatever. That you know something that if you would just more enough people knew about it would make a huge difference. That's a reason to write a book. Or if you're just pissed off about the way things are done and you want that to change, that's a reason to write a book. But there isn't, it doesn't make sense to write a book if you're saying, if you're not really offering a new perspective on things. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really great way to say it. Is there something that you have to say that if we just understood that one thing, mm -hmm. the world would be a better place? If enough people knew what you know, yeah. it would just be a big contribution. And 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 you know, and also as you said, maybe if there's something that just frustrates you or pisses you off, yeah. right? That you could that you could handle in this book and get it out there and make a change in that. Yeah. What do you wish people would start doing, stop doing what are myths that you think are harmful, all those things uh, that they make for good books. Whenever we're being disruptive and going against conventional wisdom and most people have those thoughts. And when I say world, it doesn't have to mean the whole world world could be defined as your industry, your, um, your, geographic location, your mm -hmm. um, work environment, or it could be broader than that. So it doesn't have to yeah. be all the people everywhere. Yeah. Good. I, I mean, and I definitely, um, the, I mean, cause you know, I'm, I'm always thinking about this too, AJ. So these are somewhat selfish questions. I think you probably know that uh, I find that a good list of things, right? What, what do you wish people would start doing? What do you wish people would stop doing? What are some harmful myths? How can you like, what is it that you know or believe that disrupts conventional wisdom? Yep. You know, I, I'm thinking about, you know, my, uh, my approach with, with organizations and top leaders where I think insightful vulnerability mm. is a huge contribution. And I think that, the harmful myth right now, the conventional wisdom is, you know, oh, you don't ever want to be vulnerable. You don't ever want to admit anything. You don't want to have any feelings. Don't, you know, they're going to just use it against you, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's something I would love to disrupt, you know? I hope you do. And I, I actually, you know, think that makes for a better book, by the way. So I'm, I'm always encouraging people to uh, be more vulnerable. And we've mentioned Mike a lot. That's that two things that, that we do in all of his books are, um, they're always disrupting conventional wisdom. In fact, we don't write a book unless it is disrupting conventional wisdom. But we also show him in a vulnerable place because that allows you to connect with your readers. And I guess that, yeah. that would work as well if you were speaking or in any conversation you're having or in for sure as a manager, all of it. Vulnerability helps. It helps connect. Well, you know, there's a lot of overlap here with what you do with the whole TED format, you know, in the in the TED commandments, actually, it says basically, 
don't just tell us the good stuff. You got to tell us the whole story, right? Tell us that vulnerable moment when you were down too. Um, and then, uh, I think one of the reasons people like Ted talks is because they provide a new paradigm, a paradigm shift, you know, and those are two of the biggest factors for Ted talks. I think they're, what we're hearing two of the biggest factors for Mike Michalowicz's books, probably two of the biggest factors for a lot of the books that you work on, which is why I say, you know, I don't think that, that it's the Ted format. I think Ted gets credit for repopularizing what is just kind of the original format. I mean, mm -hmm. these are things that work across the board in multiple mediums with human beings because it's just how we're wired and it's what we respond to. And it's what makes a difference for us. No, we want to hear, oh, this way we like it when we have a revelation, when you can provide a reader, for example, with an aha moment versus, you know, where they can have it on their own yeah. versus you handing it to them on a silver platter. Yeah. That's magic. And when you can pro provide connection because you're sharing what I call a mirror story where your story, although the circumstances may be different. The feelings might be the same. The desires might be the same. The frustrations might be the same. So that the reader feels like this person, okay, they see me and get me. We have different different stories, but ultimately the same pain. But I think, yeah. I think if you're talking about entrepreneurs and big CEOs wanting to be vulnerable, one of the problems is the defining what the vulnerability is. It doesn't yeah. mean bleeding on the page. It doesn't mean right. airing all your dirty laundry. No, you can be vulnerable in subtle ways. So just stay open to it and understand that it's not about, let me tell you my whole life story. It's about isolating right. moments that mirror the reader's experience. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. It, you know, you, you probably heard me say that quote from Les Brown, people don't connect with your successes. They connect with your messes. Yeah. Your message is in your mess. So, you know, looking at those vulnerable moments and what is the message that arises out of that? Yeah. It's going to matter to other people. Yeah. Les is great. It's one of the great speakers of all time. I did two book collections with him actually. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, dude. Oh my gosh. That guy, just a few words from him definitely altered the course of my career. You know, yeah. I, I, uh, He's, he's fabulous. So what are some of the other things that you think like, just like, you know, casting the net a little wider, just the questions that you hear, the things you think that people are maybe should ask, but I haven't thought to ask yet. About writing or about publishing? Maybe, you know, maybe we should talk about for a minute about like publishing and the whole, like, because you really enlightened me in terms of the difference between uh, self-publishing, getting a big publishing house, hybrid, like maybe you could explain a little bit about that world to us. Sure. And since we mentioned freebies, I have, I have in my book, I, chapter 15 is all about the, it's a crash course in publishing. Okay. It's for, you can actually just download it for free on my way to com because that's, I so want people to understand. So it's just, you can just grab it. You don't even have Great. to buy the book. Go to writeamustread.com. Yep. And it's there. You can you can download it. But Great. that said, um, what I teach in that book is just an overview so people understand because the, there's a great myth that um, self-publishing is better. And then there's another great myth. Traditional publishing is the way to go. And then mm -hmm. people don't know about hybrid, which is a combination of both. Yeah. But the thing is, none of them are correct. Because the way that you need to think about your path is what are your priorities, and then which of those uh, which of those paths fit your priorities. So instead of saying, "I agree with so and so who says traditional is the only way to go," I agree with so and so that says, uh, "Forget traditional, self publishing is the way to go." Those are not true if they're not true for you. And I think that's the problem is most people aren't educated about the industry. And it's more than we can, I mean, we can spend three hours and I would explain yeah. you right now, but just in essence, you want to consider timing. Do you, are you, is it urgent? I hope not. I hope I've convinced you on this call on this podcast, not to try and do things fast, but 
if it is urgent, then traditional publishing is not going to be your way to go because they need a long lead time for the sales team and the editorial team to do their best work. Mm. If you want credibility, if it's really important, say you are a corporate person and you just can't got to have a big publisher behind you because that's going to affect your career, you got to go traditional. That's the only option. Mm -hmm. Uh, Occasionally, there's some hybrid publishers that are top tier that might work, but they're also very, very expensive. So, um, but let's say you want all the money to yourself after wholesale fees. And so then you've got to self publish. Let's say you want all the control. You've got to self publish. So yeah. let's say you want trade distribution, which means the difference between that and wholesale means your book is not just available. Your book, the sales team is actually trying to get it sold. So they're not just meeting demand, they're creating demand. Mm. So you want, let's say you want that. Your only option is traditional publishing or some top tier uh, hybrids. So do you see how it has to be? What do I need? Yeah. Oh, another one is, do you not? Do you have zero money to invest in it? Then you need to try and get a publishing deal where they don't charge you anything. Right. So all of these things are what matters most to you, and then figure out what are the options, and then start with your plan A and work your way down because all of them ultimately are options. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I definitely, uh, I think that's really important for people to think about the and and it really does come down to what do they need mm-hmm. ultimately it's it's like one is not better than another except for in a particular circumstance exactly. right given a particular need well so um so what haven't i asked you we have just a few minutes left here uh i want to make sure that we end when we said we'd end um but I want to make sure, like, what what else should I have asked you, AJ? What else should we know? I think one of the biggest uh, questions I get is, when am I ready to start my book? Uh-huh. And the second you get the idea, because you can start working on the developmental aspect of it, just like you do with a speech. You have to take time to really think through your idea, think through who your readers are, understand what you're promising, test your content. Make sure it actually works, not just for you, but for others. Because sometimes we we do something, we have a system or a framework in place. And just like I shared earlier, I had to make sure what I was teaching actually could be done by others. So you need a lot of time to work through those things. And you also need time to make sure you have a platform from which to sell your book. So if you're an entrepreneur or a person in corporate who hasn't spent a lot of time building out an online presence, writing art, whatever you need to do, there's that's a whole nother conversation. But if you're va- basically not engaged and not visible, you also have to work on building that. So the second you get the idea, time's a waste in. Get it going. Yeah. You know, I, uh, some of the books that I've really enjoyed, like one of the, like this is not necessarily in this realm, but in the fiction realm, the, there was The Martian. Uh, do you know that book? Yeah. So first of all, I love that book. It was recommended to me by the, by one of the top, um, public relations people at NASA. Mm -hmm. So I read it and luckily I read it right before the movie came out. I thought the movie was good, but it was nice for me to have my own visuals. But, uh, that was originally written as an episodic in a, Mm -hmm. on a blog. Yeah. As a serial. Yeah. Serial on a blog. Yeah. Um, and the good news about that was that he was able to just, you know, people on the internet will point out flaws, mm-hmm. right? So he was able to get everything basically fact-checked and fixed and everything. And then he went and then he ended up getting an actual, I think he started as a self-published, did it serial self-published, and then actually got a deal with a traditional publisher, right? I think so. I don't know the sequence of that exactly, but I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, which is not necessarily the route that most books are going to go, I would suppose. Like that was probably pretty special. So yes, those are lightning in a bottle. Those are outlier situations. Uh We tend to believe that that's what's going to happen. And so then we kind of act like outliers. Uh Remember that movie? Um, if you have, I don't know if you watch many popular movies, but it's called, he's just not that into you. 
I, I remember it, but I don't think I saw it. Well, the whole point of it was all of these women who thought they were going to be the exception to the rule with this, these guys and thought, and even though the guys clearly weren't into them because when guys are into girls, they let it know, let it be known. It's not yeah. a secret. Uh-huh. And the whole point of it was you want to be the exception, not the rule, but you're the rule. And I think authors need to realize that they're the rule. Maybe they'll get to be the exception, but it's pretty rare to have success like the Martian. Uh huh. But if you realize, you say, okay, I'm the rule. I'm just going to do what I need to do to write a great book, market the heck out of it. Maybe then you'll have that success. Problem is a lot of authors look to these exceptions. Yeah. Make decisions based on them, which is, yeah. is not the way to go. There's for every person who wrote the Martian, there's, probably hundreds of thousands of people who wanted something like that to happen and then didn't do the other things they needed to do. Right. A reasonable success happened. Well, I kind of think that, um, you know, looking at you and looking at Mike McKellowitz and looking at a lot of the other successful people I know, I think it kind of comes down to having a message you care about enough Mm -hmm. that you'll just do whatever it takes to get that message out and just be willing to show up and turn the crank on a daily basis. And then if something magic happens, it's a bonus, right? Yeah. Look, um, you nailed it. That's exactly what it is. You have to have something that carries you forward because there will be days when you're writing a book that you think it's just, just pure crap. (laughs) Those days will actually outnumber the good days. So it's just better you know that. So you've got to feel like I care so much about my reader and making a difference for them that I'm going to just get through this sludge because eventually you have a great day. And those days, the bad days and the occasional great days add up to a book that people really care about. And then once you have that, you've got to get it into as many hands as possible because you know you're really going to push a book that you tried like heck to write. Yeah. You're not going to push a book that you just, mm, I'll just get. Yeah. Done. Yeah. So it really, that just comes back down to committing to writing a book that people say, this is a must read. You got to read this because when you do, you'll also market it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I didn't, f- you know, I guess it makes sense, but I, I remember reading maybe through something that you and Mike were putting out that, that like the books that really get popular are the books that people finish, you know? the good title and the first chapter and then the rest of it sucks like that. Those don't, they don't. Why would you tell anyone to buy it? Yeah, exactly. But you know, what's funny the irony is now that Mike's books are so popular, especially profit first, which is the most popular book. People tell him all the time. I love your book. And he'll say, what did you love about it? Oh, I haven't read it yet. (laughs) That does happen eventually when a book is popular enough that people, it becomes part of our culture. Yeah. And so we say we love it, even though we haven't actually read it, but it takes writing a great book to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's, that's a great place for us to wrap up. And I really appreciate you joining us and sharing your knowledge and your perspective. And I'll make sure that these links are in here so that people can go get all that great stuff that you have for free. And, you know, do you have something that would really make a difference? Is there something you wish people would stop doing or start doing or harmful myths or conventional wisdom that's just not so? Because if there's something like that for you, then maybe you need to write a book. And uh, AJ Harper has a lot of great resources for you if you decide to do that. And AJ, I really appreciate you being here and everybody who's listening. Thank you very, very much for listening. If you like the show and you'd be willing to give us five star, excellent rating that would help us get this out to even more people and, uh, have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Everyone, AJ, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. And we'll see you next time on speak like a leader dot show. Thank you for joining the Speak Like a Leader podcast. Go be awesome.